Cool. Thank you, everyone. Um, my name's Carl. Uh, I'm from Autodesk. Uh, I work there in the research team uh, working on machine learning in the AI lab. Uh, and today, uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of a rundown of the things that have been happening uh, with BREP generation. So I'm talking about generative models that are trained on, um, yeah, BREPs. So to set the scene, uh, over the last couple years, we've seen these sort of massive successes with uh, text and image generation, right? So if we ask chat GPT to, write, GPT to write a haiku about machine learning in 3D, it can do a pretty good job. Or if we want to, um, you know, use something like ControlNet to generate uh, images from a prompt and a sketch, it actually can do, you know, really impressive things. Uh, and I think this is largely, or one of the main reasons for this is because there's been uh, these massive, massive data sets of text and images scraped from the internet. But what we really haven't seen yet uh, is that happen in 3D, right? Because that doesn't exist. Uh, and 3D is still hard. Uh, this is an example of a paper our lab put out called Make a Shape earlier in the year. Uh, and this is this simple kind of canonical problem in machine learning of going from a, a flat image to a 3D shape. And you can kind of see, right, like some of the results are kind of not quite sashimi grade. Um, so, you know, even our results, right, like we're sort of hallucinating a necktie on the, on the Android and like the, the things are floating away, the antennae. Uh, and what's even more challenging is that manufacturable 3D is even harder, right, because we're dealing with precise surfaces, things that need to fit together, um, tolerances, and, and the whole deal. Um, and kind of the foundation of all of this stuff, and I think it's been mentioned a few times, is the boundary representation of solid models. It's the 99.9% .9 of, think, of all the things we do in CAD. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the work we've been doing over the last, actually, like five years or so on getting to the point where we might have a generative model that can generate these types of solid models. Um, and I want to get a little bit technical here and kind of run you through in a, in a very delicate, gentle way um, what a BREP is, um, and then sort of talk a little bit about how we're doing um, generation you know, using machine learning. Um, so a BREP is basically a, a sort of sewn together a bunch of faces, uh, and it all starts by having a series of vertices, like this one shown in pink. Um, you connect two vertices in this case, they make an edge. You connect some edges, they make a wire. Um, you connect, you know, the wire, the inside of that is the face, right? It's, it's actually very beautiful. Um, and what's kind of weird about BREPs is there are a bunch of different curve types and a bunch of different surface types. And you think about machine learning, usually it's just like characters, like text or pixels. But here, we're, we're lucky enough, or unfortunate enough, to have many different curve types and many different surface types. And they all have sort of different ways of being formulated. Another beautiful thing about the BREP is they have this really graceful sort of topology of how the different faces are connected together. So this is on the right-hand side, this is what's called a face adjacency graph. Um, so all of these um, faces are joined together in this really well-defined graph. And that's actually helpful. Um, I'll tell you why in a couple slides. So up until about 2019, like most of the work we did with um, 3D representations for machine learning was actually we just sample points. We just sample points on a, on a BREP or we'd even just render an image and then we just sort of use some of the existing uh, machine learning models out there to, to deal with, just sort of avoid the problem, right? Uh, just deal with the representation that's well known. Since around about 2019, almost all of our work is either uh, looking at a graph representation, um, like the face adjacency graph, or some kind of sequence, right? So we sort of find a way to mash the BREP uh, representation into like a, a, a token sequence. Uh, and you guessed it, um, graphs, we can use graph neural networks, which are really, really good for sort of learning a representation. Uh, and we can use transformers uh, for the sequences, right? And transformers are really good for generating stuff. So all of the, the stuff you see with large language models, it's almost always using a transformer. Um, but graph neural networks can still be useful if you're not doing a kind of generation task, if you're trying to classify you know, a cat versus a dog or whatever the, the equivalent is. Um, and for BREP generation, you can kind of break all of the work into two categories. So, and you can think about this as either learning how something was made, so like the steps somebody did, like the buttons they pressed, or learning what was made, so the shape they actually made at the end. Uh, and I call these modeling sequence generation versus direct shape generation. And I'm going to talk about these uh, today. 
Um, there's a bunch of work that's happening in the space, um, but I'm actually only going to talk about our work because, yeah, that's it's great. <laughs> so let's talk about modeling sequence generation first. So um, the first thing we realize is like we actually, uh, when you sort of have the sequential data, you can kind of play back the timeline. This is like sort of like a parametric history. Um, but we didn't really have a data set, you know, back in whatever, 2018. Uh, and so that was kind of the first thing we had to do was actually create this data set. And this is called the Fusion 360 Gallery data set. And it was the first data set at the time that actually released the sort of final BREP together with the, the steps that a user would take to, to create that data. Uh, and it contains basically a bunch of, of um, shapes that are made in Fusion 360 along with that kind of parametric history. Um, and from that point on, there was a bunch of work. We did a bunch of work, others did some work, looking at how you could kind of learn that sequence. So learn basically like how people would sketch, how they would extrude things. Uh, so we had a series of papers. Um, I'm gonna walk you through one of those. It has a kind of difficult name, Sketchgen. Um, and this, uh, first of all, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the representation that that uses. So imagine you just have a simple circle and you want to sort of feed this to a neural network, there's a bunch of different ways you can do this. Um, the way we do it in this paper is we separate out the topology from the geometry. So we call the topology here basically the, the type of curve it is. So it's a line, an arc, or a circle. So we have this uh, T in the box is, is, a, is a topology token. And then we have um, samples of points on that circle that we feed in. These are just x, y points that we feed into the, to the neural network. And I'm sort of showing you this not because it's really exciting to look at how you turn a, a circle into points, but uh, we do this sort of again and again and again for curves, uh, for loops, for faces, for extrusions, and you can kind of get the picture that all of these things turn into a, basically a series of, of tokens, uh, and that can then be basically fed um, to this, these sort of transformer networks. Um, so that's the process of turning a BREP into, into a series of uh, tokens. Um, I'm going to not dive too deep into this, but uh, this is a sort of sketched in ar architecture. But I think the, the key takeaway here is for the first time we're using this idea of code books, which was used a lot with some of the very, very sort of popular like DALI um, image generation models. Um, and uh, what we kind of send into the network is a series of tokens. And what we get out at the bottom, that confusing looking line called the CAD construction sequence, you can just think of that as the parametric history, right? Like the thing you, you click in the timeline of your CAD tool. So kind of what we're doing is giving you, in the end, a sort of editable design uh, that you could go back and sort of edit the, you know, the, the size of that circle or things like that. Uh, and what we found is this can create pretty good results, right, in terms of uh, like generating the 2D sketches or generating the 3D uh, forms. Uh, and so there's still a bunch of work going on here right now, like the current state of the art really just, just looks at sketching and extruding, but just think about all the other operations that like you need fillets, you need like chamfers, you need revolves, there's, there's just a, a lot of stuff that, that could happen in this space. Uh, and the nice thing about this approach is that you end up with this editable parametric model. And so that, you know, for a lot of people, parametric models are, uh, a thing. So uh, direct shape generation. So this is the other approach, right? So here we're not looking at like what people actually sort of clicked in the interface. We're looking at the, the final shape you get. And think about this like a dumb stip file um, or I just file, right? Where you have none of that sort of information about how the shape was made. It's just, just the, the literal boundary. Uh, and a couple years ago, we, we published a paper. Um, this is called Solid Gen. Um, and uh, this was sort of looking at, really it was the first generative model that could actually generate these, the sort of directly generate these BREP shapes. Uh, and so again, um, it all starts with a bunch of vertices and what SolidGen is essentially three different models uh, and it's essentially like a sewing model. It like kind of sews together. Um, the edge model basically picks vertices to sew together and then the face model picks edges to sew together and sort of you have this hierarchy and you build those up one by one uh, and what you end up with is this sort of sewn together uh, solid model. If we sort of walk through that by looking at the architecture, um, you can see that along the top here, it first predicts a series of points, uh, does that sequentially, then basically the, the next model, the edge model is saying, hey, I wanna reference those points, join up to make edges uh, and sequentially you do that and you have a, like kind of a wireframe uh, and then the final process is like saying the similar thing, like let's point to those edges to say, hey, these are gonna be uh, dis different faces that make up the solid model. 
Um, and what the, the cool thing is, is when you actually look at this, you look at like how the model is generating these things, uh, one by one, it's sequentially like predicting these, these edges and then predicting the faces, uh, and it makes a, a pretty animation. So um, what's interesting about this model is that it's, um, at the same time, it's sort of using these um, analytic surfaces, right? So it's using the, the cylinders and planes, um, but it can't do the more sort of freeform stuff you might want to do with, say, like industrial design applications. So the, the work I want to talk about that's new as of this year, and we presented this at SIGGRAPH, uh, is a work uh, called BREPGEN. And this is actually, a lot of this is in collaboration with the student, um, Sam, who's now actually working for us. Um, and this is the first BREP diffusion model. So you've probably heard of Midjourney or Stable Diffusion or DALI. And these are all um, you know, image-based uh, diffusion models. Uh, and they're really, really taken like the image generation quality from something which is pretty rough back in the sort of early days of GANs to something that like, you know, that's actually pretty impressive um, now. Uh, and so image diffusion models, if you're not familiar, they're this pretty simple idea um, that you can sort of sequentially uh, Introduce, like, introduce noise to an image, so you take this little kitty cat on the left, um, you mess it up by adding noise, and what you're asking the neural network to do is basically sequentially sort of learn how to remove that noise. And the intuition here is that's much easier to do uh, in steps rather than uh, you know, all at once. And that has some implications because you know, the inference time is slower, generally they take a little bit of time. If you've ever done mid-journey, you can kind of probably seen this, this sort of uh, diffusion process as it happens. Uh, and for BREPs, it looks much the same. So we uh, have a couple of levels of diffusion. So one is at the, the sort of face level. So we sample points on the surfaces of these, these, these uh, BREP surfaces, and we sort of mess them up and then try and learn how to remove that noise to recover the underlying shape. Uh, and likewise, uh, for the edges, we, we do the same. So we sort of basically sample points on the edges, mess it up, and then try and remove that noise. And at the end, um, we can then stitch that together to create these solid models. So I'm gonna dive a little bit deeper into this because this is kind of new and kind of fun. Um, and it gives a little bit of a sense of the things we have to do to, to, to get things to work in a neural network. So you may recall, yeah, BREP has a bunch of faces and edges and they're all different types. Uh, and the way we can kind of make it a uniform a representation is by sampling points. So if you look at uh, the points in 3D, they, they look like this. Uh, but if you actually kind of look at them in, in 2D, it really just looks like an image, right? Like, so if it looks like an image, we can basically pass it into the same type, types of neural networks that have been very um, you know, well established in the image domain. So it's either a 1D or 2D image. Um, so we have those, and we're basically squashing these points into sort of 2D bins. Uh, and then we run them through like these kind of classical uh, variational autoencoders to get the surface embedding, which is just a signature of that particular uh, surface or a curve. Uh, and one of the challenges we have to address with BREPs is unlike images, we have a sort of fixed, you know, 100, and 100 by 100, whatever size. BREPs, we're lucky enough that they come in all different varieties, right? So we have some really complex models with a lot of faces, some are really simple. Uh, and so we need to be able to handle all of those cases. So um, this particular model has seven faces, uh, and, but then each of, the, each of the faces have you know, different numbers of edges, and we need a way to handle that. And the way we handle that is actually by adding uh, duplicate edge curves. Um, so in this case, each face gets a copy of its surrounding edges. Uh, and then likewise, for uh, the edge, uh, it gets a copy of its, its surrounding start and end vertices. Uh, and the easy, actually, the easy way to look at this is to kind of look at it as a tree. So if you think of this like the overlying structure where these little colored nodes represent the different faces, we're essentially sort of breaking those apart and giving them their own little uh, duplicate version. And we do that uh, for the edges as well. Uh, and so we sort of make it so that it's a sort of consistent um, shape of the tree. Then we also have to have uh, duplication to pad out. So neural networks typically want a fixed size. So we have to typically, yeah, typically have to sort of pad things out. Uh, and we do that by sort of adding or duplicating some of the faces as we, before we sort of pass it to the, the network. Um, 
so that's sort of some of the dirty little secrets, right, in terms of getting stuff uh, to work, uh, getting, being able to pass the stuff into a neural network. Um, and then once we have that, we can run this through our um, sort of latent diffusion model, right? And so what you're looking at is the animation of denoising those surfaces. Uh, and likewise here, you're denoising the edges uh, of this lamp. And then through a, a post-process, we can then you know, rebuild um, that uh, solid model. Um, so let's take a look at some of the, some of the results, right? Um, so on the left-hand side columns, you're seeing basically the denoising process of the, the, the surfaces. And then on the, the right-hand columns, you're seeing the denoising process of the, of the edges. Uh, and this is basically trained on like a furniture data set. So the, the things that are spinning are, are the reconstruction of that solid model. Uh, and so all we're asking the neural network to do here is to just basically give me a, you know, a random shape. And this is the type of thing it creates. Um, so here's another example. So again, you can kind of see this denoising process happening. It's really fun to look at. Um, uh, and we can train it also on mechanical CAD data. Uh, and you get you know, the types of parts that you typically kind of make, these sort of prism prismatic shapes. Mesmerizing, all right. <laughs> so, um, so one of the things we can do is we, if we have labels, right? Like we have um, labels for different types of furniture, we can say, hey, give me a, a random lamp, give me a random bed, uh, and that's sort of generation based on the class. We can also do things like shape completion. So if we have a partial um, like uh, set of surfaces, we can say, hey, give me a bunch of um, versions of the completions of that uh, that might um, you know, fit in with those input shapes. Uh, and you can see it, it's some interesting stuff happens, right? Like when you give it four legs, it can come up with either a bed or, or a couch. Um, and so that's kind of interesting, right? If you think of kind of autocomplete like workflows. So um, I'm going to wrap up. And uh, just like on a final note, I mean, just like the professor before me, I'm going to talk about some things that are kind of unsolved problems. Um, just to assure everyone that AI is not going to take over everything. Um, I think the first thing here is like, like it's not all good, right? <laughs> like we have some examples in our, in our paper. It's like missing faces, self-intersection, wobbly surfaces, and we're not talking about STL files. This is, this is BREP land. Um, so first of all, yeah, there's, there's issues with generation um, and also just with part complexity, right? Like generating complex parts is a challenge. Also, just none of these parts right now, they're not aware of any kind of assembly that they exist in. So I think there's a bunch of sort of generation stuff that could happen. Uh, it's also been really exciting to me to see like some of the discussion around physics. I think physics guided generation is, 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 is just an area that's been underexplored. Um, I think there's many, many diff different ways of going about that, but it's a really exciting area because I just think it makes um, you know, a bunch of things more kind of robust, uh, you know, existing in the real world, let's just say. Uh, and the final area I think is new interfaces for controlling generation, right? Like I'm pretty sure none of us want to type in uh, <laughs> type in, in text and do CAD, right? Like that's kind of not really going to be super helpful. Um, but I, I think there are other modalities like, you know, sketching things that like, and this is a, a paper we had called Sketch a Shape, where we did this sort of sketch to, to, to BREP generation. Um, so I think there's somewhere in between there is a, is a sweet spot um, and a way of like kind of using some of the, the tools we have today. Um, so that's it for me. Um, this is my LinkedIn. If you want to connect, you can scan, um, blow up my phone. Um, but yeah, happy to have a chat with anyone after the, after the final talk. <laughs>